Welcome. Welcome to the February 14th uh, community meeting for KCP. I'm dropping the issue into chat. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, so I believe um, Andy Anderson made the first issue. Andy, are you on the call? Sorry, I was on mute. Hi, everybody. So a um, number of different developments happening at KCP Edge this past week or so. We've got some um, critical mass around uh, a reading list that we've developed on uh, medium so if any of you are interested we're starting to proliferate proliferate a lot of information having to do with experiments that we did last year and incorporating those into the kcp edge uh, point of view and uh, we're starting to see results in indexing in google for things for seo and so forth so we're starting to do a lot oh that's that's terrible so try just kcp-edge.medium.com Maybe the reading list doesn't show up. There it is. So in the top in the top uh, collection there in KCP Edge. So there's a number of articles that have been picked up by other providers. We've written some internally, and there's some that we're shadowing from folks like Chick Fil A and Cisco and others that are starting to do experiments in this space. So uh, we also came. If you see the logo, we came up with a logo this weekend. I ran it by some of the folks over at KCP. I think it's pretty cool. It pays homage to KCP itself. So uh, when we think we think it it expresses consistency, heterogeneity, and uh, scalable edge configuration management. So those are some of the the developments that are happening there. So that's item number two. Okay. Item number one, we've we've uh, started to uh, we created what was what we call a coding milestone. I just dropped the link in the in the chat here. So. I am shamelessly soliciting help <laughs> to try and complete this coding milestone. We have a number of different areas uh, that we'd like to uh, work on. And if you, would you, Nolan, would you mind bringing up that doc that I just put in there? Yeah. <clears throat> so the top half of the document describes some of the spots where we need some help. And these are more kind of high level. There's issues now being created from this in the KCP Edge repository itself. And if you scroll down a little bit, one of, uh, one of the areas where we're trying to emphasize is good first issues. I think it's a good practice to, and help people get like, you know, um, acquainted with how KCP Edge operates, what we're focused on and where we're where we're starting to do experiments. And some of the spaces where we could use some help specifically from KCP, I was coming on this call to uh, you can stop me from talking if you volunteer for one of these items. So I'm just going to filibuster here. So uh, yeah, so we have a few items you'll see. One specifically is in underneath KCP, uh, issue number 2682. It's, a, uh, it's basically a way to have the sinker do different behaviors uh, based upon some uh, switching in, internal to the code. And we'd like your help there. It'll help us change the behavior of the sinker. Mike can elaborate a little bit more on what that is if you'd like him to. And we also have another uh, item that's closely related to this that's also on that list. And uh, we can use some help from KCP as well there. That has to do with uh, denatured objects and for the purpose of synchronization. So we were thinking about the possibility of alternative object types, but uh, the general gist of these of these issues is that we've got for denaturing is that when you send down an object to be throughout the through the topology or wherever the KCP API machineries exist, you don't necessarily want the API machinery to act upon it. You know, in other words, take a deployment and turn it into pods. Uh, you may want to just use it as a place to stage 
and pass it on to the next level for then for it to be acted upon. So we call those denatured workspaces or denatured behavior. And we could use some help there. So on those, and there's one other in there. Uh, we've got some large scale testing that we'd like to test out. And we thought maybe Steve might be helpful there. So those are the three items. Would anybody like to help us out from KCP? Maybe first ask if it was comprehensible, if people understand. But David has something to say. Yeah, David, please. Um, I'm not going to propose my help directly. I mean, in terms at least of, of big, um, you know, resource involvement because we we already, you know, use those resources. But um, about the sinker, at least, uh, just wanted to notify that there is ongoing work, uh, at least for the. I think one or two next weeks about uh, adding support in the sinker for uh, multi shard. And this will obviously uh, change a bit to refactor the structure of the, you know, main sinker flow. So, um, yeah, that just could be useful if we can uh, sync together and maybe <clears throat> avoid starting some sort of refactoring, you know, and extracting common parts of the sinker before we do this refactoring, because it's going to be just more work. I mean, I'm not saying we should not do it before, but at least take that into account. Just wanted to to raise that. So, David, I was hoping that out of all the folks assembled here, that you might be one that could offer us a little bit of your time. We understand it's more on the it's it's more trivial than a major refactoring to do what we need it to do. So would you be open to helping us out? Yeah, and sure. Let's, and, right, let's just put a little bit finer point on that. Uh, David, I think there are two points of divergence that we've identified between the TMC sinker and the EMC sinker. Sure. Yeah. One we discussed in the previous call about whether or not the containers in the edge yeah. cluster get connected back to the original workspace API server versus the local one. For yeah. that, I think, you've been saying it's really just disabling a block of code in the yes, existing sequence, right. right? So we just need you to point out where that block of code is that, that needs to be disabled. Yeah, yeah, and then sure. we, we can submit a PR that, that does the, the work there. Yeah. The other thing is, um, and we haven't had time to discuss this yet uh, in any detail, uh, but we've been talking about in, you know, denaturing certain object types, um, but the sinker will need to renature them. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll need a, a kind of a plug point where we can plug in something that will renature these object types. Um, and again, you know, maybe just, you know, if you can just put your finger on where that plug point belongs, you know, we can do the PR to actually make it so. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say the, the first one is, is quite simple. And even if there is some, you know, restructuring of the main sinker flow for multi-shot support, this should not really hurt even if you do that if any if even if we do the separation first uh, for the second point probably it requires a bit more thought i mean i i'm not 100 percent clear because it also touches the the type of the resources uh, mainly exactly yes so, i do expect that takes more work. thought yeah. um we're willing to do most of the work it's just you know you're the expert on the code yeah. so it would help yeah. us a lot if you could just kind of point us where we need to be looking yeah, no, no problem, and, and just we, we can possibly, you know, set up some meetings, uh, you know, just working sessions or anything like that. Sure, you know, I, I won't we be able to touch in the code, but but adv giving advice is is not a problem. Thank you just very much, Richard. All right, that's all I had for today. Thank you very much for the time. A Andy, I would write advise more than assist. Assist sounds like more than advise. Tomato and tomato. Okay. Well, go ahead. Let's. Uh, let, I'm. Uh, I can defer back. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy, Mike, and David. And I believe uh, Mike is next. On. I don't know, I'm not sure if you want to continue the discussion on denaturing objects. Yes. This is again picking up something. Uh, it really happened in the edge um, community meeting last week. But uh, you know, Stefan and Andy and David were, were really getting into this. So for this community, uh, for Edge, we have this issue of what we're trying to do is use a KCP workspace as a container for a description of the desired and reported state of a workload that runs uh, self-sufficiently at the Edge. 
Um, so we're using a workspace as a container, um, but the problem is that some kinds of objects, they affect the API server behavior. So we can't just use a regular ordinary workspace as a container for any kind of object. All right, if you want to put an RBAC object in, if you want to put um, you know, a CRD in, uh, you know, these things affect the API server behavior where you're putting them. So uh, for CIDs, actually, this is an easy case because we want their behavior. But for the RBAC objects, for example, we don't. Uh, there are other things like admission control plugins also that affect API server behavior. We want those running at the edge, not in the center. So we need a way to um, have denatured objects um, in the center for these kind of objects. But we want stuff that's been shifted left to view them as the ordinary types. Uh, Stefan proposed a nice uh, solution, which is the stuff that's shifted left works through a view. So um, the stuff that's shifted left, they, it thinks it's dealing with regular RBAC and regular admission control plugins. Uh, but the view translates them into denatured object types of some sort. We need to define exactly how they're denatured. Um, there was a suggestion that came up last week of having a deeper sort of API import uh, and sorry API export and binding, um, so that sort of regular workspaces would bind to the regular definitions of RBAC and admission control plugins. But uh, we would also, in this case, be able to bind to denatured versions of these. Um, I think that's. I, I, don't, I think that's more mechanism than we need. I don't think we need a, a new kind of API export and binding. Uh, we're talking about a fixed set of type object types that are known at development time. So um, all we really need is ob alternate object types. And the view can just translate have a fixed built-in at development time translation. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to um, kind of maybe we, if we could reach some conclusion um, and, you know, on, on the, and then you know, proceed. Andy. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I am struggling a bit with denatured. Can you give me a definition and example, please? Sure. Yeah, by denatured, I mean simply that uh, this is an object that is stored, but has there's no no controller that does anything about it. So um, RBAC, for example, has controllers. And the problem is for where well, there's controllers built into the API server, right? So the API server has controllers to act on RBAC objects. It has stuff. That, that acts on the admission control plugins, right? So if someone who's developing for the edge, they have RBAC objects or admission control plugins that they want to run in the edge, they don't want it to run in the center. So they need a way to, you know, all the code that's shifted left that thinks it's developing RBAC objects and admission control plugins, you know, and, and is gonna, you know, do a coop cuddle create or whatever of RBAC objects and admission control plugins, it needs to not actually affect the behavior of the KCP workspace. We want okay, this so you workspace want the, to just hold you the, want the stuff. You want the stuff stored in KCP, but it's just sitting there doing nothing. It's inert. Exactly. That's what I mean by denature. Okay. It's just it's and, inert. And then it gets synced to workload clusters and then acted right. on there. Okay, exactly. Thanks. And that's why we need the plugin in the syncer so that when it arrives in the, the workload cluster or edge cluster in our case, it actually gets renatured and it becomes real RBAC, real admission control plugins. David. Sorry, was it wasn't mute. Yes, I was about to say <clears throat> maybe it's a technical detail, but it might not be in the syncer. The, the same way you might have a view uh, for you know um, uh, end users. To, to put their objects as with the normal APIs, uh, the same way that you could have a view that the syncer points to. And this view right. would do the renaturing. So, I mean, mainly you would have two views that do the, the inverse thing. Yes. Renaturing, renaturing. And the syncer would be just normal, the normal one, which yes. would make this much simpler on the syncer side due to how it, it is managing, you know, dynamically managing the GBRs. Yes. Another possibility that occurred to me, probably not preferable, no. is we could add a controller in the edge cluster that does the renaturing. So the sinker propagates the denatured objects, and then separately on the on, in the edge cluster they get copied into renatured objects. Uh, but that sounds like you know that's two copies of the objects. That's that sounds like it's more trouble than uh, the, what you suggested. Uh, so I think we had another hand up. Yeah, I saw one go up and down. I didn't catch it. Oh, okay. 
Um, I was going to ask, are these views going to be like hard coded or, or defined in the code versus um, dynamically generated via an API, API export? Is that your thinking? Well, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not really familiar with the view technology here. Uh, I, you know, I'm, so this is, you know, for the Edge MC repo, I think uh, we would be responsible for the view. Um, I would need to learn more about what it takes to actually implement a view. David. I assume that, you know, I assume that the, the current Sinker virtual workspace, well, which is Sinker view, if we can say so with the new term, uh, would be quite an, at least parts, of the, the simplest parts of it would be quite interesting as a uh, as an exercise to, to look into, because mainly it takes the list of the resources, uh, exposes them based on, you know, what exists on the sync target, and then exposes only the, the objects that are, you know, planned to be synced to a given synchro. So obviously all the inputs you could take, uh, you know, with your own rules of, of uh, agency but the main principle of having a view that only exposes a subset of apis possibly you know changes in your case you would pro probably change the group name or something like that but the schema would be the same so probably you could start from the the sync of virtual workspace if i'm not mistaken thank you i'll start looking there and there was a question in chat uh from, um Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but Mangirdis, uh asking if there's a write-up or a doc. Uh, yes, in the Edge MC repo, I do have a PR that hasn't merged yet, uh, introducing an outline of the POC we're trying to work on. It's it, it's it's in fact still a work in progress, because as you can see, you know there's still design being done about uh, these handle, handling these denatured objects, um, but. You know that that's where you can find what's written. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have read. I think we were discussing the two items that I brought up, and maybe we're done now. Yeah, I was gonna say it sounds like uh, the action there is to investigate the um, sinker view and see how that translates or could be used. Yes, Andy asked for a link to that PR. Let me just get that for you guys and drop it in chat, and then I'll uh, I, I'll do that offline. Go ahead and proceed in your agenda. Okay, um, Fabrizio. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Fabrizio. Work from Pumware. Uh, um, yeah, I worked before with uh, Vince and Andy Cluster Cycle, and since I'm missing to annoy them with my request, I'm now looking at KCP. So yeah, but uh, apart this, so uh, what happening? I'm starting ramping up in uh, KCP. Um, I found uh, I'm experimenting, and uh, initially I started uh, doing uh, everything by command line, uh, but then I started to look at the end-to-end -end test. Uh, following suggestion from David, uh, which I thank you, and then to end, end test out are really useful to learn how things work. And so I figured it out, uh, but there, there is a, a, a problem for people learning is that end to end test basically goes through only one scenario and they do not allow you to easily experiment. And so I come up with something that I'm going to, to share to you and see if you are interesting or not is basically uh, things that I built on top of uh, KCP end-to-end -end test framework. Uh, can I share for a, to show it very, very, very quickly? So, uh, okay. Uh, share. Okay, here it is. So what, what I built is uh, another plugin which I call the KCP Playground. What it does, it takes in input a, a config file, and we will have a look in, in a second. And basically, it spin up everything that is written in the config file using the, uh, the framework utility. In this case, it's building up for me a, a shard, a pair of kind clusters, and then it is creating workspaces, uh, sync targets, whatever defined and then basically if i want to use my plugin my environment 
I can use a, a single Kube config, which really means it's a Uber Kube config that sum ups all the shards and uh, and uh, kind whatever. So I can do stuff like uh, Kube cutter use a shard or Kube cutter use a big cluster, and each uh, and quickly switch from one to another. So I don't even have to need to have the cognitive uh, effort to follow about where Kube config are. And just to look at this, is this uh, the config file for now, it is allows you to define shards. For now, it supports only one, but that's a detail. Within the shard, there are workspaces, uh, which could be nested. And within workspaces, you can have uh, sync targets, placement, and, and yeah, then you can easily add whatever you want. And just to show you that this is backed by if if you if you remove all the scaffolding to get a a Kubernetes cattle plugin, basically this is the code that spin ups everything. It is not a big amount of code, and yeah, as you can see, it uses a framework. Uh, give me a, a KCP cluster. Give me a workspace. Install the sync framework. What it is? Install sync and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, I, I find it nice. So I decided why do not uh, go back and show to the team and see if they are interesting in it or not. That's super cool. Uh, Mike, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I'll tell you my experience running through uh, the quick start in KCP. I actually like uh, issuing the commands by hand. And I even went through it more slowly than the quick start. Is I, you know, to really understand what's going on, I looked around objects before and after uh, each command so I understood in more detail what the commands are doing um, so uh, you know don't lose that you know I think it's important that people be able to go through slowly and carefully and examine what's every detail of what's happening uh, know how to do it for themselves um, it's it's nice to have something that's kind of one button automated or just a series of button pushes but it's also, I think, important for people to be able to dig in in all the details and, and poke all the way around. Um, and that reminds me of another issue, uh, which I'm not sure how it's reflected right now in issues in the repo. But there is you know, an issue with the current quick start is it conflates um, the use, conflates some different roles into and uses the work, the root workspace for in unusual ways. Right. Uh, in sort of the usual scenario. You would have more workspaces, and and the quick start, you know, overloads the workspace. Sorry, the root workspace for things that we would never advocate. We don't advocate. Um, so I think, in terms of just the scenario, uh, regardless of how it's presented, I, my advocate, my position, and I think someone else said it too, the scenario should be more articulated so that it uses other workspaces in a more typical fashion. We don't want to mislead people, right? We want to lead people thinking in the direction we advocate. David? Yeah, maybe just just a point on this last uh, uh, point, yes. Um, there is an, a pending peer about uh, changing the readme and the quick start in order to use two workspaces, one for location workspaces and one for um, user wor workloads. Uh, at this time, someone raised, you know, so, some, some community member raised the fact that it might be a bit too complex as a very first you know, readme, where you just want to execute your workload inside uh, a single workspace. So, I mean, I think we, we should continue. I, I brought back this issue, commented it recently, and we should, you know, probably in the community come back to this issue. I, I'll try to post it afterwards and, you know, comment and possibly uh, vote on that, uh, you know, or at least decide uh, which approach is the best. But clearly, uh, it's completely understandable. Fabrizio? Yeah, I just, just want to answer to the, the question about uh, following step by step. I think that that's a great point. Uh, at the same, so um, maybe I want to uh, very, really fast in, in the YAML where I define the scenario, there are a bunch of comments describe what, what happens, what makes, uh, so this scenario basically allows you to repeat and change iterate uh, very, very fast and experiment, which, uh, yeah, it, it is helping me to understand KCP. So yeah, there are value in both methods. Uh, uh, 
as I will say, as a, as a people approaching, and I'm also trying to help some other colleagues to look at this as well, it's kind of hard uh, dealing with KCP, uh, a, a bunch of uh, kind cluster, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the, in the meantime, trying to figure out your mental map of our space uh, come up together and this uh, L5 can help you to build this metal pipe. So yeah, there are pro and cons, and I understand uh, your, your comment. I am, uh, I learned a lot about, uh, by go, uh, going comma by command, but then when I wanted to iterate fast, this kind of conflict-driven things helped me a little bit, so yeah. yeah can I just add to that also? Um, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think there's um, another idea that has occurred to me is I think we could use a picture. You know, if, if someone drew a picture of what's going on in this quick start of, you know, all the API exports and bindings and the workspaces and you know, just how things relate, um, you know, I think that that would also help make it much more uh, comprehensible. Yeah. Andy? Uh, this is awesome, Fabrizio. Uh, thanks for working on it and showing it to us. Um, I think we should merge it. So, um, I mean, maybe we call it something like test bed. Uh, I mean, playground is fine, but whatever. We'll come up with a name and bike shit on that. Uh, and then I think this is just a, a yes and. Like, you can do step by step, you can do this. So, uh, they're both extremely valuable. So, uh, kudos to you, Fabrizio. This is super awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing a PR. David? Maybe just a thought about, um, you know, the demos that uh, once existed in into KCP that we dropped because they were much too complex to maintain and quite a big bunch of, of bash. But um, one idea was that, you know, you... And, and then we switch, obviously, to extensis, extensively use uh, end-to-end tests, which is the, the right direction, obviously. But, you know, in some cases, I don't know you, at least for me, for myself, um, I'd like to test manually um, with my own, you know, according to where I am in the development, things that finally will be tested in the end-to-end -end test as well. You know, especially if you think of high-level end-to-end tests like the deployment splitter, like, you know, the, the, the complete test where we check that um, the workspaces downstream are correctly isolated uh how services can communicate or things like that these are really high level uh features that we also mainly you could just do a demo with exactly the same thing as what you have in the end-to-end -end test for such things it seems to me that it's very it, it could even be have a great value that we have the same um you know bootstrapping uh method for all the context and then that would be used both by the end-to-end -end test and by the manual test that you would like to do, uh, for example, to debug, uh, simply. Yeah, go ahead, Fabrizio. Yeah, I, I totally agree. When I was thinking at this, is that, okay, when, when I got this, uh, let me say, wrap up, we can ideally rewrite and to end test to use uh, the same machinery that I use in the playground to spin up the end to end test scenario. So you will basically have a, have a, a configuration you can use it in the end to end test, or you can spin it up uh, locally and play around it manually. So that, that could be some interest. The, the fact that this is leveraging on the test and on the test framework could open up to some interesting things uh, that can help also to develop. Go ahead, Mike. I just want to urge you to remember, if you're aiming at developers now, it needs to not just run on the Linux host where the CI runs, but it needs to run on all our laptops as well. So it needs to work on Mac OS. It might work, need to work on SigWin. Uh, you know, it needs to work on all of our development machines. Fabrizio, I'd be, I'd be willing to help test. I'm going to share the PR soon. Thank you for the Very feedback. good. Yep. Yes, I have colleagues who use Sigwin. Um, I've, I've gotten um, feedback from them. OK. Um, 
with that, I'm going to see if Andy is available for his um, Flakes and Docs updates. I am. Thanks, Nolan. Uh, so over the past couple of weeks, we've spent a lot of effort in trying to deflake the test failures that we were having. And uh, there have been some major bug fixes that uh, went in towards the end of last week that hopefully will significantly reduce the amount of spurious test failures that we were seeing in our end-to-end -end tests. Uh, so I would say that the two big ones were an issue where if you had multiple workspaces and each workspace defined the same CRD in terms of uh, group resource, so you know, widgets.kcp.io, but they served different versions. Then we had a problem. And this was really an order of operations thing. So depending on which test ran in which order, uh, either all the tests would pass or they wouldn't. And that's been fixed. And then there were also some flakes in uh, a few of the tests that just needed to do uh, some operations inside of our framework eventually blocks instead of just trying a single operation and expecting it to succeed. So if you're working on uh, a test that works with API bindings, for example, uh, when we're in a multi-sharded environment, and we do have a CI set up for this, the uh, works or exports, API resource schemas, API bindings land on different workspaces when we're or land on different shards in different workspaces in a multi-sharded test setup, and there is some increased latency in replicating the resource schemas and the exports to the cache server, which is then used by various controllers. Uh, so when there's this increased latency, you may create an API binding and expect it to work quickly, but it might not because of the time to replicate data. So there's a lot of places where uh, the tests need to be more verbose in terms of doing the eventually blocks on trying to create instances of API bindings, trying to create instances of widgets or whatever. Uh, so if you are working on a test and you see it flaking, please feel free to reach out uh, on Slack or GitHub. We'll help you out. Uh, but if you look in test grid for our periodic jobs that run, I think, every three hours just against the main branch, it's a nice wall of green, which is really good to see. So that's flakes. And then for documentation, uh, I'm working on replacing our Hugo-based docs with make docs using the material theme. It's a lot easier to maintain. It has support for multiple versions easily. So I know, Mike, this is something that you've been looking for. So uh, either this week or next week, hopefully that'll land. And um, for anybody involved, it's in my opinion, uh, a whole lot easier to work with. So um, I have a preview site uh, that is, hold on, I'm gonna get the URL. Uh, give me just a second. Or Nolan, if you have it. <laughs> yeah, slash KCP. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I have done minimal effort in terms of trying to style it. Uh, I have the same blue that we use on our current live website. I have the logo up in the top left. Um, it does support multiple languages. So if anybody wanted to do translations, we uh, have the ability to add additional languages. Uh, you'll see the link to the GitHub repo in the top right, which I think is live data in terms of the latest release and stars and whatnot. Uh, it has search built in and uh, it's pretty easy to work with. So uh, I'm, I have a couple things left to do. I'm trying to make it super easy so that you can uh, test out serving documentation locally. So um, to avoid asking everybody to install Python and pip uh, packages, I'm gonna do a container image so that you can just run this inside of your favorite container runtime. And uh, then once I do that, I need to get the GitHub action set up to publish when we uh, push updates. So 
look forward to this. And if anybody's interested in helping with styling or content or whatever, uh, once we get this merged, would definitely welcome any contributions. And that's all I got. And uh, regarding this, you are still working on getting the actual version support, right? The version yeah, I just, I've only, in this preview site, I've only published the one from Maine. So um, what I have to do is take all of the changes that I made to the main branch so that it publishes the with what you're seeing right now. And I have to backport those to the release 0.10 branch. And once I've backported those, um, I'll run the same commands that I ran to generate and serve the main branch for 0 0.10, and then you'll see a version selector. Cool. So it relies on what's in the GitHub branches. Yeah, it uses the awesome. GH pages uh, branch. So um, it's pretty straightforward in terms of publishing to, to GH pages. And um, we only build the content that changes mm -hmm. as needed. So if we're not changing 0 0.10 whatever, we never have to rebuild that content. If we do change it, we'll rebuild it and they're distinct. So like the main branch builds the main branch and, and so on. Sweet. And thank you for tracking down those flakes. Um, I have a question that this may be premature, but should we mm -hmm. default to testing uh, EDE based on shards versus one instance? We do in CI. So Prowl and GitHub Actions run, I believe, with two shards today. And the uh, most, but not all, of the EDE tests will create workspaces on random shards. Uh, the transparent multi-cluster tests were waiting for the sinker view to support being backed by the cache server. That merged yesterday. And so now the folks working on TMC can update the EDEs to work in a multi-shard environment. Um, there are other tests that we specifically place workspaces on the root shard or on a specific shard, but those are, are test specific. There's a reason for doing so. In general, when you're writing an end-to-end -end test and you're creating workspace fixtures, you shouldn't need to, um, to give it an option that says, Put it on the root shard, um, but if you if you know that you want to test, um, like purposefully test that workspace one goes on shard one and workspace two goes on shard two, there's ways to do that as well. Cool, uh, Mike, you had your hand up first. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just realized, remembered it's something I wanted to put on the agenda. Uh, the the plan for uh, v zero dot eleven. Okay, um, let's jump to. David, if he's got something on the same topic, and then we can discuss V011. Yeah, I was just just about to say that that for the TMC for uh, you know sharding and end to end tests, um, there is the shard support in the sinker, but there is obviously more than that, in the sense that we have to revisit uh, mainly the TMC related fixtures as well, because the sinker, you know, you have to to point to the right sim target in the right shard as well. So, I mean mainly what was done for the API exports, you know, when you have some helpers in the end-to-end -end tests to take to, to point to the right shard and get the objects where, where you should, you, we have to do something like that as well uh, for all the TMC-related fixture, mainly the sinker fixture. And so that's probably one of the, apart from, from the sinker uh, aspect, that's also probably one of the reasons why all the TMC uh, tests would fail. Uh, until we do this, this change. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, Mike. So yeah, uh, V011 plans. I know last we talked, we were looking at getting some bugs fixed and deflaking. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Um, yeah, so I, I we tagged alpha.0 not because we were trying to release it, but because uh, some of the work that Vince is doing in controller runtime and the controller runtime example repo, uh, it was easier to have a known <laughs> tag instead of trying to go off a, a Git SHA. Um, so I'm not aware of anything off the top of my head that would prevent us from releasing 0 0.11, or we could release 
uh, alpha dot one if we wanted to um, if we need some more time to get some stuff stabilized but I, I think we're uh, we're good unless folks know of things that are outstanding with the exception of the docs work uh, but that can certainly come after we cut the release Stefan do you know of anything Sorry, I didn't. This is what's the release? Missing things. Yeah. Is there any? Are there no, any I'm bugs or PRs? I'm not aware. Yeah. Your CID fix, I think, was the last one we agreed on. Yeah, I, we have 16 issues that are um, in the 0 0.11 milestone, but I don't know. I mean, a lot of them are, are sort of multi-release um, issues. Uh, Go ahead, David. Looks like he's yeah, the link in just chat. just uh, I posted one here. Uh, it's a pending peer. It probably quite easy to to review. I didn't have time to look into it. It's related to you know there was a problem when you do a bind compute, and it was not correctly choosing between the path or uh, the cluster name aspect of it. So you you were not able to bind in some cases if I uh, summarize the, the issue correctly. So that might be interesting just to look into this and and, and know if, if it's worth um, including into 0 0.11, because this also the same as, as what I uh, pointed out uh, the last time, it might increase uh, notably the, you know, support requests in the, in the community channel just because it's a basic bug, but that requires searching everyone uh, each time everyone hits it uh, yeah i mean we can we can review it and merge it before we cut a release or we can yeah the other it, it, it might be worse i think Okay. So is there a resolution here? Is there a plan for deciding? Um, I mean, we have, so we have uh, the alpha tag. Um, so you, you could work off of that if that's what you're looking for. Um, or are you looking for something that's more, uh, I don't know, <laughs> publicly announced in terms of, hey, we're ready with 0 0.11? Um, I think it's in some sense a multi-part question. So the, the issues I'm thinking about are, well, first off, yeah, what tags are uh, imminent? How does this relate to the rebase on the later versions of Kubernetes? Um, what level of maturity can we, should we move our edge MC work onto the alpha or some other tag uh, now? Um, you know, these are the kinds of things I'm wondering. So the rebase is an easy question to tackle first. That will come after we release 0 0.11. So it'll be in 0 0.12 uh, rebasing to Kubernetes 126, or we could backport it or, or do it in a 0 0.11 future release if we wanted to. Um, I don't see any reason to hold off transitioning to the current alpha zero tag or a final tag if we cut one. Um, so if, if it's easier, we can just cut 0 0.11.0 and um, then for you know additional things we can have new patch releases i would imagine that you wouldn't want big changes for patch releases i wouldn't put a rebase in a patch release uh, but yeah. you said not that would be 12. um so uh let me just ask this alpha zero tag i wasn't aware of it um how new is it what what is it does it have any meaning or or maturity it, it literally is a git tag that we created so that the controller runtime example uh repository could use it in the go module is it a semantic a version days can, I, ago. can we even use yeah. it as a semantic version yeah okay mm -hmm. it's totally valid we can um, i mean we can go actually we probably should do a newer one that has the crd fix i can do another one for alpha one um so it would it would be if we use it it would be something that would, should show up in the doc site um obviously it's going to, it includes the the logical cluster v3 um mm -hmm. yeah so if it's going to show up in the doc site i um okay if it's not going to show up in the doc site i would want to hold off 
It will. Um, I, you know, like I said, with the docs update, it's going to take me another couple of days probably just to work through the remaining tasks that I have. Um, and then I can get it published. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Vishnu. Uh, hey, hi, everyone. Uh, so I need uh, help with the uh, issue. So currently I'm looking to, I mean, uh, this is the issue. Currently I'm looking to gather some metrics related to KCP. So our team is primarily interested in analyzing Sinker, like uh, how much latency is required you know, to uh, uh, sync all the resources from KCP workspace to our AWS cluster. So during the try, I have noticed there are only like few metrics and I have tried expanding Sinker logs wherein I can see some of the latencies. But are these metrics getting published somewhere so that we can you know, scrape on top of them and visualize them? Um, let me know like uh, you have to if I have to give more context yeah. at least for me I, I didn't take time for now to to look into this so I I should probably look deeper uh, into <laughs> what you're doing and, and the requirements before you know okay so generally uh, does sinker uh, emit any uh, metrics related to the latencies like how much time this, uh, it's taking for resources to get synced from KCP workspace to uh, mm. a cluster or a client cluster. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. Can you point out uh, me through the right links so that you know I can go through them in detail? We don't think this yeah. was focused, right, David? It hasn't been mm. focused to to write metrics, but I think we are pretty open to add those. Yes. So, I, I mean. I'm not. I don't think the logs were, you know, designed or you know put initially with this is my this in mind. You might find things interesting in the logs to to base your metrics on. Uh, on the other hand, maybe we we could think how to integrate metrics into the sinker in a more you know native way, mm -hmm. possibly. Uh, maybe have a, a dedicated session for that and, and brainstorm on that could be useful. OK, so as of now, like uh, if I wanted to get, uh, I mean, any metrics related to KCP, like what would be uh, the right thing to do? Like, uh, you know, I, uh, what we are trying to do is uh, we want to use KCP with one AWS cluster versus multiple AWS clusters and see uh, and get all the metrics for both the cases and see like how they are performing. You know, uh, just to see if we find any metrics interesting. You know, to analyze it from the performance standpoint. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood clearly. Are Are you saying I haven't looked? Um, but I'm a big fan of Prometheus metrics. I I would assume. Are you saying the Synchron right now doesn't have any d particular designed Prometheus metrics? I mean, I couldn't find any like uh, as of now. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, so I'll just reiterate. I, I totally agree. The sinker should have designed um, uh, Prometheus metrics. Okay. So. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, it, it's it it should be a a dedicated thing and not just something we we conclude from the logs or you know infer from the logs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, apart from that, I'm trying to understand if there are any other metrics which I can collect. So yeah, I understand like uh, Sinker is not currently publishing metrics to Prometheus in the AWS cluster, but yeah, uh, in future it might like uh, as we are talking about the roadmap. But apart from Sinker, do we have any? Do we have any other metrics that we can use for analysis purpose? So for like KCP in general, you mean? Yeah, yeah. In in general, yeah. Go ahead, Andy. I would say uh, rather than asking, are there any metrics? Uh, I would encourage you to suggest what sort of metrics you're looking for, and then we can go add them. Uh, we, uh, I've experienced with other projects uh, like Cluster API, for example, where uh, we filed issues saying we should add metrics, and nobody could really point to what metrics would be useful to collect. So if you are looking for particular information, pieces of information, um, mm. please let us know. And we can either get them added, or if you've got time, that'd be cool as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, for now, uh, my team is primarily interested on sinker metrics. Uh, but as a, I mean, 
uh, as an external note, I have asked for the other metrics as well. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll check back with my team and you know uh, be specific on what metrics we are uh, uh, interested in apart from Sinker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Also mentioned, um, I don't think he's on the call anymore, but Sergius put this PR in for um, getting Prometheus metrics out of the EDE tests, but I'm honestly not sure what his source is. Um, so that this PR uh, 2774 may be worth looking at. Yeah, I took a look at that PR as well. I tried it out uh, in my laptop. like. Uh, so I wasn't able to see any Prometheus data getting published. So I ran the tests. It's mm -hmm. ran successfully, but uh, I couldn't see any Prometheus data. Number. Not Prometheus underscore data hidden failure. Like it was mentioned in the PR. OK. So yeah, I, I, I added a thread on that, actually. So one second, let me share the link. So here is the thread link. Uh, which I tried out uh, the PR, and I wasn't able to see in Prometheus data. So, I mean, I got another suggestion from Sir. I mean, then I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that as well. I mean, uh, but uh, feel free to suggest me, like, uh, if you are able to see any Prometheus data uh, related to interest in twin tests. I'll take okay. a look again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have six minutes left. Do we want to go through some of the open issues? Do a quick triage. I think there's only like six, maybe. Okay, let's take a look. Seven. Okay. Um, you can actually just click on the link and it'll open off to the side. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, if it's a bug, uh, just we'll put it in the backlog. Yeah. Why am I blanking? Where's the backlog? Status. Backlog. Um, Another one. Yeah, same one. Yeah, seems. And draining. That one needs some investigation. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be the same behavior, but uh, it sounds like maybe it is. Documentation. Um, looks like Frederick has this. Double check. Frederick, are you? Um, working on that now or will work on it in the future? Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't following. Um, uh, I need to work on that. I haven't started on that. Uh, I was basically uh, working on the end to -end test, but uh, I'm kind of blocked there because of uh, uh, the, the approach. So I was asked to use a private cluster for that. Uh, it's not uh, uh, good anymore. So, uh, and my idea was to follow up on the, uh, uh, the documentation uh, afterwards because I have limited time. But uh, yeah, I could start working on it. But uh, that will take me, uh, and I'm not sure to, to have something completely basic. Let me put this in progress then, or set it for your next. Yeah, um, we, we we still have uh, so the enhancement proposal, we, which provides some level of documentation. So it's not like there, there is nothing, and uh, manifests are part of the enhancement proposal. Okay, we'll set it for next since it's waiting on some things. Um, feature requests for the backlog or the scraping. Uh, meta generation. 
Yeah, that one just came in. Um, I, this is a transparent multi-cluster thing and needs some thinking. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, there's a wider area here where we have to, to think about. And sinker fails to pull CRDs through. Oh, okay. It looks like something is going on with an yeah, order of operations. Yeah, this requires analysis, I think, to, to understand what's, if it's, I mean, what's, if there is an underlying bug. Okay. Cool. Then um, got one minute left, so I'm going to say that's it for today. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great week. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Bye.